So I'm going to start um, where I think the beginning is. Um, I graduated from college. I was 19, um, October birthday. So I got an internship right away. This was in 2012, um, May. And I interned for about four months with a great company. Um, worked my ass off to get an internship there. They'd never had a designer intern before at that ad agency. So like it was kind of new for them too, um, which was really nice. But um, after that, I got another internship because I was trying to find a real job, not an internship because they don't pay you. But um, I was bartending and also working um, pretty much during the day as like a lackey slash sponge slash what can I get ya slash receptionist relief. I would say. Um, learned a lot about everything, um, but not everything, everything. Um, so a year had gone by and I was searching for a job. I was getting desperate, um, to be honest with you. I was living on my best friend at the time's couch with her partner in a one bedroom apartment and I had just gotten out of a very oh, toxic relationship with a long-term partner who I was living with so all my stuff was still there and I was um, trying to find a job and a place to live at the same time um, in the beginning of 2013 so around the same time May um, by now I was 20 and uh, so I was like really worried about my friendship because <laughs> I'm not a person who prioritizes the same things as your average person especially domestically um, we j it was just it was just really hard on us and her especially just living with my stuff and me and how I was at that time I totally understand why it was hard um, so I found a boarding house it was cheap it was just one room furnished which was great because I didn't have any furniture at the time um, and all my stuff was in storage so at the same time I also got a call about a freelance job in an ad agency that was really amazing, um, super reputable, and really high ranking um, on paper wise, like look really good on your resume. So I was offered, I'd say, ooh, let me check this. Okay, one second. It was a lot. Okay, services performed as of May 3rd, 2012. Freelancer will perform the following services, junior designer, that's what I was at the time, sorry. I 
and get this. In 2012, at the age of 20, I was making a rate capped at $280 a day, which meant they had me 24 hours a day for that price, essentially, like up and until like, you know, if I wanted to get paid that, I, I would be there, you know, person. So the contract date was for May 6th to the 17th of the next year. So your contract, um, all expenses were covered. business related so all taxis and like meals if we were working late type of thing just invoice for that um I had to submit an invoice to them for my freelance work I got paid 30 days later but I remember asking for an advance so that I could put a down payment on the boarding house because I was trying to get out of this place and thankfully I got the job and I had been working for about a week and payday was coming up and I forgot that um, there was a 30 day post payment thing. And so I actually talked to the accountant who was great and um, still is great, you know, she's really wonderful. And uh, she gave me an advance, which was pretty great. And I got into a new unit and um, a room I guess and at first it was really great like we all had responsibilities um, I had cleaning day I had uh, you know do the dishes day um, be responsible for each other's spaces it was just it felt like more communal and a little bit more supportive and manageable for like someone like me who can't handle cleaning up a whole house but can handle like one job at a time type of thing um, so that was working for a little while. Um, and that's kind of where we begin. I was freelancing and um, living in a boarding rental, trying to make enough money to get into a uh, one bedroom. It was Toronto, so it was really expensive. I think at the time it was like $900 for a one bedroom um, and like, I didn't have guaranteed income at the time, like yes, I was contracted for a year, but I still kind of held on to my bartending job and was even offered like bar, bar lead and um, accepted it, um, but then realized like due to the hours I was working, I would never be able to be available to do that or take on more responsibility. So even though I was trained for it and like they spent so much time with me, working with me on how to how to do it, and I felt horrible, but I had to tell them, like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I have to focus on, like, this, because it's uh, my career, and it's what I want to do. I want to be a graphic designer in advertising, and, um, yeah, so that's the beginning, and so I started working, and I was doing really well. Um, it was me and a senior designer only um, at that agency. He was working solo prior to me cold calling them and asking them if I could work for them. Um, he was very thankful that I was able to help and that I knew what I was doing. Um, he was a wonderful mentor and friend and still is to this day. Um, but yeah, I freelanced with him and I worked with creative directors as well as art director teams, copywriter teams, um, like they're the same team. <laughs> I don't know why I said that differently. Um, but there was around maybe six to eight teams at any given time and they would do the ideas and the preliminary artwork, sketches, um, expectations, rollout, and we would roll them out and make it, I don't know, graphic and put it on the computer and then able to print it out. So it's not a sketch anymore, it's an actual real life thing that we can pitch to the client, which was 
primarily our job as well as um, preparing files for print and publication and also coming up with ideas too on top of it so like rebrands and renaming and logo designs and stuff like that so while we were working on um, advertising work for the copy and art directors um, we were also working on uh, graphic design work uh, for other businesses too um, and we had a production um, team as well and a in-house uh, print production team so everything that we couldn't handle went to them as well which was really helpful but it was just a, a lot of work for two people um, it, it was a lot to handle it was a lot of amazing work um, that I was really excited to be a part of because it was big names and brands and things that I grew up idolizing um, things my family used to talk about, things my family still consumes, um, so it was like a big deal. And I was freelancing there for about three months, four months, um, and we started planning a party that was going to be an event. Uh, it was going to be a week-long Monday to Friday event, um, and it was going to be an Olympic-inspired drinking-slash-game-type uh, round-robin between every single employee. You had to be involved. Um, so I was tasked as the junior to come up with all of the in-house branding, um, all the signage, all the artwork, all the accessories, all the like all the like hanging things, um, the table, the rallies, picking people's names out, um, and then also creating a hype video for before that too. Um, so there was a lot of work on top of my regular workload. So there was a lot of in-house work as well, just like agency specific, which wasn't bad. It was just a lot all the time. I didn't mind doing it. I was really excited to do it. I got to do some like cool things, but it was so much stuff like for me to handle. Like now I know that. Um, but so we were planning this event and it was a huge deal. And um, yeah, like a week long ping pong darts and foosball round robin with an, a client, I'm being very careful, sorry, with a client that supplied us unlimited amounts of their product, which was alcoholic. And we had two built-in bars in the agency with kegs and mini fridges and tap systems. Um, that we would design, uh, like one of my jobs was to design taps and glasses and beer glasses and one of, it was like an office space. You go to the bar for a meeting, um, and you have a beer and like, it wasn't taboo to have a beer at 9am in the morning. It was actually normal. And a lot of people did that all the time. And it was a mixture between what an advertising agency that you would imagine from Mad Men was and like a frat from like a, a university mixed like with, yeah, it's like bro culture mixed with like the greater good, um, we're changing the world mentality. There's nothing else that's more important than what you're doing right now, right here type of environment and um if you didn't indulge then like you were chastised you were bullied um you were talked about as that person that doesn't participate who's better than everyone else so it was extremely important that i just fucking fit in a and 
I was pretty good at drinking by the time I got out of college, so beer pong wasn't an issue, and neither was flip cup. And um, yeah, when you work for an agency who gets a free beer pong table from a celebrity that lights up and glows and also turns into 10 different other fucking drinking games, you're kind of encouraged to use it and um, not film it and post about it because the client wouldn't want the world to know that we're doing that because it's wrong. It was horrible. Like, it was the most toxic environment I have ever worked in in my life. And it got worse. Like, the parties were fun until they weren't fun anymore. And what I'm referring to is the night I was sexually assaulted at work in front of 15 to 20 other people that I worked with on the rooftop by a senior creative director. I was recently, before that moment, hired full time as a junior graphic designer there. Salary, benefits, I was also sending money home to my mom to help with rent and my sister, who was in university at the time, after a nasty divorce. I was dealing with my dad, who was also going through divorce and had been charged with assault, and I didn't know who to believe. So I shut out my dad. And I regret that. But I have a really good relationship with him today. And I'll get into that later. <laughs> What's important is um, I was sexually assaulted by a senior colleague and nobody did anything about it. Nobody reported it. Nobody got me to a hospital. Nobody checked in on me. It was a complete, complete bystander effect. And Yeah, it was horrible, like, to look around at people while something's happening to you and see how shocked they are in their eyes, but they're frozen. And then you go to the next set of eyes and they're frozen. And by now you're trying to mouth help me or do something and nobody does anything. (laughs) So he stopped. He just stopped on his own, I think. Like, I don't... I blacked out. Like, I was in pain. I was being humped into a picnic table, a wooden picnic table, right here, right below my boobs. So my underwire was pushing into my chest. Um, He was about 300 to 400 pounds. I have no idea. I honestly don't care. He was a bigger guy. And uh, big enough that I would not, I couldn't move because there was somebody sitting here and somebody sitting here. I couldn't get up. I couldn't risk going under the table because like he was humping me. He was humping me in front of every single person we worked with, not everyone, but a lot of people into this picnic table and laughing. And I don't remember a lot, you know? Because, like, trauma is real. And my brain has protected me for so long that 
up and until last year, I didn't really even fucking remember that this all happened there. And I knew something bad happened, but it was like a Pandora's box of bad that I had no idea about. I remembered that either that same night or another night, a colleague came to my house, my boarding house where I was staying at the time, because I was apparently <laughs> texting them to come over and have sex. And um, I don't remember doing that. <laughs> I probably did, but uh, definitely was not capable or able to have sex at that inebriated state. Um, I remember being woken up by either a person that's an, another boarder or like my phone. I don't remember what woke me up, but I remember I woke up and I think it was a boarder because I remember somebody saying to me along the lines of like, there's somebody at the door for you. And I was like, what? Like half, like really drunk and stupid asleep. Like I was sleeping. And so I went downstairs and like I answered the door and it was like somebody I worked with and uh, somebody that I trusted, um, somebody my age at the time. Um, he was somebody I went to school with. So I, I knew him more than like I knew anyone else we worked with and I trusted him and I regret that. He helped me up the stairs. I don't even know if I locked the door. He um, brought me to my room. I don't even know if we shut the door. Brought me to my bed. I don't even remember going down the stairs. <sighs> I remember points of it. Like, points and phrases that'll never leave my head that I can't repeat to you because it's it's just gross and about a month later was my birthday um, so I was 21 traumatized and from the point of the rape up and until my birthday and the end of October and beyond, but specifically October, I was being chastised for sleeping with this person, sleeping with this person, shitting where I ate, being the slut in the office, being groped and hugged inappropriately or for too long, being picked up off the ground because they're taller and they want to squeeze ya a little bit tighter, being called jailbait every time I wore a certain dress, getting gifts for no reason unwarranted by people who were in seriously committed relationships, if not married. Being told that I would most likely be the first one pregnant. It was horrible. And I couldn't tell anybody because we didn't have any HR. I didn't even remember it. How could I even tell somebody that it happened? Was I a slut? And did I sleep with him? Because everyone's telling me I did, and I sent these messages, and I have them, but I don't remember. And then 
I was at the Halloween party and it was the next party since the Olympics and same thing come up with all the in-house graphics all the signage all the posters come up with some sort of hype before the event alcohol 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 let's go party 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 um that night I was sexually assaulted again by another person that worked there this person was an intern and then they were hired on as a producer a junior producer and he followed me into a closet I was in the closet because I was wasted and it was the only dark room with no sound which I needed at that time so he followed me in and he sat down on the ground and I told him why I was in there and I told him that I had to shut off the lights because my eyes hurt and he said okay same so I said, cool, and I sat back down. This guy was in a relationship with a girl that he, like, is now married to. Like, I did not assume anything from this person, and to be honest with you, it was the last thing I expected from him. And I just felt him move closer to me, and I felt him try and hold my hand, and I pulled it away and I felt really uncomfortable and I froze <laughs> and he kissed me and I stopped him and I got up and I turned on the light and I told him you have a girlfriend and I left and I went home and I stopped drinking so much at parties um, because it wasn't just that it was everyone else seeing us leave the closet So I knew that I couldn't find safety inside the agency. There was no space that was safe for me there, ever. And if I was gonna avoid any type of like sexual assault again, then I had to go outside. And that was like the only option. The roof was not an option because it was very triggering to go up there. I had a lot of, um, honestly suicidal ideation um, it wasn't a plan it was just that's that's just the one that's the way it's where it happened it's where it's ending like that that was my darkest time and um, I'm so much better today <laughs> um, I don't ask people where the roof is anymore you won't find me on one <laughs> hanging out and I'm sorry for acting flippant about that but it lit I am so thankful that I do not feel that way anymore um, and it's been because of copious amounts of therapy um, and a lot of self-work and help from so many people including my family so to keep going <laughs> um, I found out around that time that the guy I had been seeing was only interested in me to get a job at the agency. And I was shocked. Like, that had never happened to me before. Um, I ended up getting him an interview. I don't know why I did that. But, um... Unfortunately, we had um, like a unprotected, if not somewhat protected sex and before his interview, obviously. But um, full disclosure, the condom was left inside of me. I couldn't get to it. He wouldn't take it out. It, it was, he was an asshole. Still probably is. I don't fucking care. But um, like a day later, 
I, I took it out because like the last thing I was going to do was go to a doctor and be like, I have a condom inside of my vagina. Like that's embarrassing as fuck, let alone telling you. God damn, no. So I got it out and um, I wasn't on birth control at the time. So about six weeks later, I get confirmation that I'm pregnant and all of their bullying is confirmed in my head. And by this time, it was Christmas, and I was working overtime alone in the office and getting sick all the time from morning sickness. Um, I went to the doctor, and they didn't test me for pregnancy. They tested me and told me that I probably had the flu. So I went home and told work that I probably had the flu. That's why I was getting sick. Um, and everyone went home for Christmas break and I did a little bit and when I came back I had an abortion it was fucking weird um, completely dissociated myself I know that now sorry alarm um, but I didn't know that then um, so I kept working for another year and instead of getting help I took up smoking I didn't really know what to do so I knew that none of these people smoke cigarettes so I could go do that outside as much as I want and get away whenever it got weird so that's how that happened at 21 started Smoking Belmonts, fancy as fuck, because I thought I could afford it, which I couldn't. Good to know now. Um, yeah, so that helped. That was like a major coping mechanism. Um, I started smoking a lot of marijuana, just like to numb the pain. And this was before legalization, so this was like risky behavior in order to get marijuana in order to numb the pain and I was willing to do that and thankfully I was not hurt and I do not recommend anyone ever doing that like, do not go on Kijiji do not do that do not get into somebody's car I know that people will probably be like what are you talking about like people deliver I'm just like they never used to okay <laughs> just be safe um so I was not okay, and I was coping by, like, self-harming, I would call that. Um, I had so much morning sickness for so long that I was almost addicted to it, and my body was dealing with the fact that the doctor told me that even if I wanted to keep the baby, I would be having a very, very risky and traumatic pregnancy because of all of the stress I'm currently under at work. And it's already showing on an eight week ultrasound, which destroyed me. Like it, it was, a, was not a choice and it, it's a choice, but it didn't feel like it was a choice. I was 21. I was having my first career within the first year of it I was being called these names and being told this is what was going to happen to me and then it happened to me and all I wanted to do was die like I just told my mom who was thankfully was there with me that I couldn't possibly bring a child into this situation I can't even take care of myself I can't even protect myself at work I don't want anyone to go through what I went through and like have to deal with that and like thoughts about my childhood and like everything I went through as a kid it just it built up because I've never had to think about it before and then it forced me to and a week before the evacuation 
he had an interview. And he was sitting on the couch. And I don't know why, but I tried to say hi to him. And he ignored me. So I went out for a smoke. I never told him because he just didn't seem to care. Um, I didn't want him to, to care about me. I felt like he could care less and all he wanted was a really good job. And that's sad, but I didn't even know, so I don't, I don't know. My choice, I guess. He still doesn't know. I probably won't tell him, remember. After that, I kept working. Um, I was getting worse. Uh, I was very dangerous, I would say, just in my behavior. Very loose with my lips. Um, I would mutter things like, um, that I wanted to say, but I would never be loud enough to say them out loud. Like, I would say them in my head and they would kind of like come out in like a and like people just thought I was like weird. Um, I don't know. Lots of stuff happened and it was just like overwhelming, consuming. Constantly reminded of the trauma. Constantly working with those people. And um, seeing them win. And having, I don't know. Like years later today, like I go back and I'll look at all the projects that I worked on and like my name's not on anything. Um, or there's just like no graphic designer position whatsoever on the award. Meanwhile, I worked my fucking ass off for that. Like I wrote scripts too. And you can't give a junior graphic designer credit for writing a fucking script. Like that's your problem. That's not my problem, but you made it my problem. And it affected me horribly. I had ideas stolen constantly because I was just a fucking graphic designer that like I worked my ass off to get a promotion. And I got it. A year later, I was promoted to an art director. And nobody could steal my fucking ideas anymore. They hired another graphic designer. And everything worked out. Until they started saying that I was sleeping with my partner. Which I couldn't handle at all. Because I needed to trust him. But I couldn't trust him because he didn't trust me. Because he was being told that he was going to be pursued a lot while I was there, like right in front of me. When I finally left, um, I heard a rumor from my roommate who's our mutual friend still worked there at the time. This was in January of 2015. Um, that the reason I had left was because I had confessed my love to my writer and he had denied me such love and therefore I could not handle it and had to leave the agency. Okay, boomer. No, I left because I was assaulted, sexually assaulted, raped. What? You bullied me, bro. Like, and now you're going to spread rumors and jokes about how, like, I'm just wasn't cut out for it. I've heard so many times that I couldn't handle advertising. If you think that, you're right. Because advertising doesn't accommodate people with disabilities. 
the agency I worked for still to this day does not have wheelchair accessibility. Because they don't want to. If, you, if you're in a wheelchair, you can use the freight elevator in the back by the parking lot. That's how much they care about disabilities. No HR. Nothing. Nothing. No resources. When I finally quit, they offered me the, the finance accountant who also helped me in the beginning offered me they'd offered me money to just leave that day and to not like work two weeks because like why like what the fuck everyone else worked their two weeks and I'm the only one who like has to go home and like now you're concerned about my health It's a joke. Like, you guys thought I was a joke. And you treated me like a thing. Literally. I felt like an object. I was so fragile that if anyone touched me, I would break. That is how I felt. I was a vase. I felt like a fucking vase in that agency. But I tried to find more work, more work. Sorry. Wow. Need water. <laughs> so I worked with somebody who could get me freelance work. He was great. Um, and I started working at another agency. I was contracted there freelance, and it was it was really great. Um, they had recently won a pitch that I had worked on at the agency that I was working at previously. Um, so I was working on stuff I was already familiar with, and that's kind of how I got, um, I don't know, not in into it, but like I, I was a little bit more passionate about the project because like it was a telecom, so it was like, um, hey, people hate them and your job is to help people not hate them and like that's a pretty cool job in my opinion and like I'm all for that because um, that means that we can possibly influence a corporation to change um, is what it says to me so that's why I went there and I worked there for about three and a half months um, I stopped working there I was offered a full-time position as an art director um, at another agency. So I took that, um, said my goodbyes. Um, they were lovely. And I moved over. Um, this new agency was smaller, um, but they've been around for a while and they were really close to where I was living at the time. So it felt like a win-win. Um, mentally, I was doing okay. I wasn't well but I wasn't super bad I guess I don't know I was declining rapidly and um, this was like the last job before like I gave it all up you know um, you probably don't know um, but like I kept giving myself ultimatums in my head like if I can't make this work then something's wrong with me like I can't stop thinking about things like I can't stop picturing things or hearing things or assuming people are doing things they're really not doing um, it's affecting my work like if this place is different then I'm okay and so I went there and I worked for a while and it was going really well um, for I'd say two and a half months and then I noticed my creative director um, disrespecting my colleagues for no reason. Um, calling people, <laughs> the people that I worked with, who were also graphic designers, by the way, just... I would call it, like, internal agency slang. Just not what they're titled, unless 
Like, they chose that personally. Like, call them what their professional title is. Don't call a graphic designer a MacBook artist. It's insulting. Like, you, you don't... Like, that's not funny at all. Especially when you see that person's face and they look up and they're like, okay, sure, I'll do that. Because they can't say anything. Because you're the boss. And you're also an asshole. Stupid. Anyway, the straw that broke the camel's back with that place was... I walked into her office and I was concerned because there was a problem with one of our projects. Like, there was a huge problem. Um, I think there was something messed up with the print and we had to re reprint everything um, and I had to go down and, and look at it or something, something like that. Um, which is what I was trained to do. So it wasn't a big deal. I was just like informing her that I had to go do that. Um, and like she's sitting on her couch in her office and she like looks up from her paperwork and she's like, oh, you're so beautiful. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, okay. Like I didn't know how to take that. So I took that and then I walked it back to my desk and I sat down And I remember telling my partner and like the other team, there was two teams, junior teams, um, me and them, and um, us and them. Um, and they literally thought that I was fucking her. What the fuck? Like, It'd be really nice to just like do my job and not be viewed as like this extremely promiscuous harlot of a woman. Like, give me a fucking break. I went to school. I fucking earned my spot here. I didn't sleep my way to the top, even though you tried. Fuck off. Ugh, that's it. Anyway. I left, <sighs> quit, um, stayed in Toronto for a couple months, declined super rapidly, was out of money, my roommate was upset and she wanted me to move out, um, so I planned on moving back to my mom's, which was heavy to accept at the time. I had only been working for like two years and I still had like all these loans I had to pay off and like I couldn't just go home and get better but I had to so I thought about it a lot and I got really depressed and I walked around my neighborhood and found a bridge and called a taxi um, as soon as I got to the bridge I called a taxi and asked them to come pick me up because I needed to go to the hospital and they took me I thanked them and I went in the wrong entrance <laughs> and I went into the right entrance and I was admitted um, and they pretty much just told me that I was high on marijuana. Gave me two forms for support groups, um, and they gave me a release form. I didn't listen to anything I said. So I called my mom while I was there for the first time. I opened up to her and I told her this is what's happening. This is what I want to do to myself. I'm scared and I don't know what else to do. And she bought me a Greyhound ticket the next day. I was able to get through the night and I was able to get home. 
with my mom and she picked me up and right from that station we went to an after hours clinic and they wrote me a letter to give to the emergency um, receptionist at the hospital that we were living and pretty much saying that I needed to be admitted immediately for psychiatric care and to bypass everything, which I didn't know was a thing, but it is apparently. So there was that. Thanks, mom um, and doctors. Um, so we went to the hospital and by the time I was actually talking to a real psychiatrist and not like a student of psychiatry, um, I was able to calm down for the first time ever in like years by that point. It was incredible. And um, the doctor noticed and uh, asked my mom, like, where is she going to stay? And um, she's like, oh, she's sleeping with me, like, in my bed. <laughs> and I was, like, kind of looked at her. I'm like, what? She's like, yeah, you don't, you, I'm watching you. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Like, okay. And he's just like, the reason I ask is because we can admit you. However there's a possibility that you would be get, be re-traumatized or traumatized again if uh, you were admitted because of the current patients we have admitted in the inpatient ward right now. And so because of that, he advised that my mom take specific care of me. And then I was, um, I was scheduled to meet with the outpatient services center at that hospital which is how I was able to obtain a psychiatrist, um, no cost, a uh, talk therapist at no cost. I attended dialectical behavioral therapy for six months, no cost. I attended cognitive behavioral therapy for, I think, four weeks to eight weeks, um, no cost. All of the extracurriculars and activities that they provided with group therapy were incredible and it saved my life. I was able to go on to disability, which was very hard to convince me to do because I had only been working for two years and I didn't really th think I qualified. Um, but I do, so there's that. Um, so I've been on the Ontario Disability Support Program since 2016. Um, I applied for the Canadian Pension Plan as well. Um, and because of that application, I was automatically granted ODSP. So I have both um, because of my disabilities. And I'm going to get back to that after I have lunch. Thank you for listening.